Hi, this is Sapin Bharti and we are here at Cuban Cloud Native College at Atlanta and we have with us once again Rama Yanger, Chief Evangelist at the Cloud Foundry Foundation. Ram, it's great to have you back on the show. Hello Swapnil. As always, it's a pleasure to be speaking to you. Yeah, and it's, it's a tradition that you and I uh, meet at is KubeCons, uh, so we should continue this tradition. Uh, first of all, talk a bit about, because this time the layout is a bit different, uh, booth setup is a different, which is uh, a positive change in the way people can talk to each other without shouting, without yelling. <laughs> Booths have enough space so that yeah. people are not overflowing into other booths. So talk about how has been your experience so far at this event. And since also your chief evangelist, you are kind of part of <laughs> that. So you might be a little bit slightly biased, but, but talk about it. Yeah, so every year, Swapnil, uh, the booth experience and the sponsor experience is, you know, um, altering in different ways. Uh, yes, this is like, I think, one of the biggest venues that we've been in. It's been very convenient in terms of getting people queued in the right kind of way. So there's there's not like the um, swarm of people like London was or like the train of people that Amsterdam was in the past. But it's like a nice distributed crowd throughout the day. And I, I kind of favor that. Um, it, it's also that a lot of the people I've been speaking to mentioned that it was a bit of a slow start, but it's really picked steam as the days have gone by. And I think uh, like the biggest thing for me that I like to notice in the booths is the first time I started coming to this, it, a, a lot of it was cloud native and Kubernetes, everything. Uh, and then it became sort of um, WASM and Knative and EBPF and all of that. And uh, last year, obviously it was a lot of AI this, AI that, but this year, I think everybody's just flexing their NVIDIA partnership. You know? So so everything is an NVIDIA partner and, uh, and uh, you know, AI based, blah, blah, blah. So that's interesting to know. Talk a bit about the history and uh, where the project stands today and what kind of problem it really solves. The problem it was meant to solve, it was created to solve. And those problems are still there. I think we just as an industry tend to rediscover a set of problems in different contexts and environments. Um, we did it for the cloud uh, and then we did it for containers and then we're now doing it for Kubernetes and we're starting to do it for AI. So how do you take stuff that people have built and how do you put it in production and what are the 93 steps that you have to take in the middle, right? So that's, that's something that's only changed a little bit, if you think about it in, a, in an abstract way. And so Cloud Foundry has always aimed to be the substrate that sits between a developer and infrastructure and make sure that the code that you've written is running the way you meant for it to. And bonus, it does it in an open source way. So you're free to pick up the code, install it on your you know, cloud provider of choice, and then you know, ship all your code to it and it will just work and give you a URL. And I think preserving that developer experience, which is quote unquote magical, is what we've consistently been offering for the past 10 years. And those who those who've seen it love it. And, you know, it's just a question of getting more people to see it. Now, even as a community, we've had to rediscover all of these things in the era of Docker, in the era of Kubernetes. And so there have been so many Cloud Foundry updates over the years that, uh, and you've done a great job of, you know, covering all of the stories so far and documenting them. But uh, there have been so many Cloud Foundry upgrades over the years that have really positioned it as the platform or substrate of choice, no matter what the new technology is that's come along. And we're even meeting the AI wave. So if you have LLM-based AI agentic applications, for example, it's a good way to put these workloads in production. You can throw inference workloads at it. You can throw training workloads at it. You can throw even the long running workloads at it. And Cloud Foundry, because it has a pretty advanced scheduler, can manage all of these well and make sure that your compute is efficiently utilized. Yes, I have been uh, not only keeping an eye on Cloud Foundry's journey, you know, as you rightly mentioned, talking about it as well. But then slowly we uh, started seeing Kubernetes everywhere, Kubernetes everywhere. But then 
Cloud Foundry also evolved to cater to that space. So can you also talk about uh, how Cloud Foundry has evolved into to fit into this Kubernetes everywhere world where sometimes what we have seen is that, to, I mean, as much as you can learn from Kubernetes, we talked in past also what Kubernetes can learn from Cloud Foundry the, to bring the whole developer experience, Kubernetes in more loud theory. So, so talk about that journey as well. So I'll tell you a couple of stories, uh, mostly from what we've heard at the booth. Nobody is running Kubernetes in isolation. So there's Kubernetes and there's so many non-containerized workloads. There's so many containerized workloads not running on Kubernetes. Some people have mainframes. You know, it's not surprising that there's so many varieties of workloads that are running for every organization. Um, so there isn't a scenario where, at least where we've come across of where somebody said, let's get rid of everything else and we'll only run things on Kubernetes. So there is a world where you know, VM-based workloads run side by side with Kubernetes-based workloads and AI workloads are coming and going to run side by side with that and maybe they have some legacy workloads from way before that they're still using on just bare metal or some private cloud, etc. So you have a huge diversity or variety in the kind of workloads that people are running and that trend is here to stay and there's a cross-pollination of ideas, there's a cross-pollination of, hey, our Cloud Foundry workloads do this. So maybe those best practices have to be ported to Kubernetes as well. And on the flip side, you know, there's Kubernetes that enables X, Y, and Z for me. Can Cloud Foundry based workloads also get these benefits? You know, so so there's there's a lot of these patterns and tools and things that are just, you know, running side by side, doing very similar things. And a lot of them are just going to end up, you know cross-pollinating and applying um, experience lessons from each other. And we're going to see a lot of that happen, and I'm happy to see a lot of that happen. And this was evident from the keynote earlier, which is uh, when Chris Anichik was talking, one of the earliest people in the room when Kubernetes and Cloud Native kicked off was Cloud Foundry. So um, he mentioned this in um, London, he mentioned that here in Atlanta. And you know, I think it's hard to ignore how much Cloud Foundry has sort of influenced a lot of these technologies, but also the the world is going to evolve into new things. And, you know, you can't say, oh, Cloud Foundry is the only way that things should have run. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to say that either, but there's always some nice things, you know, across the board. A lot of things you folks pioneered back then, you know, when other technologies were in a very, very nascent, infant stage. Now, uh, as much as we're talking about Kubernetes everywhere, the fact is now AI is everywhere. Uh, so can you also talk about uh, what role do you see of Cloud Foundry in AI, especially MCP and Tropic last year, yeah. how is the platform enabling teams to build or host agentic AI applications without compromising on some of the basic principles that Cloud Foundry or developers, you know, want? All of Cloud Foundry, in my opinion, is two distinct pieces. There's the stuff that runs the workloads and there's the services that are offered through a broker. So you basically run stuff and then you consume the services through the broker. And so now data which you use and LLMs which you use can be offered through services. All of the training and inference are run as workloads. And so the, it's a very simple fit into the Cloud Foundry world for a lot of these applications to come and start running. So it's not hard for engineers to be able to translate the training and inference workloads into jobs on Cloud Foundry. And you know, once you have all of the LLMs and the other data that's served, you just connect those two together and you, know, you have a great sort of infrastructure for AI-based workloads and AI-based work. And obviously your Bosch has to install on GPU-based infrastructure things like that. But, you know, anybody who's run cloud platforms can see this, set it up and get going with it. Yeah. Um, and, and on a very gimmicky note, people wrote an MCP for Cloud Foundry. So you can just instruct a prompt and say, um, you know, 
can you deploy this on Cloud Foundry for me? And it will just deploy it for you. So you don't even have to do the iconic CF push. <laughs> so, so that was very nice to see. But I think there is a future where people are going to prompt and see something in production as opposed to people writing code and pushing it to production. So Cloud Foundry already does half of that. So if you marry it to an LLM and give the right kind of prompts and it can write all the code for you and then push it to cloud infrastructure, I think, you know, prompt to production is could be a future where Cloud Foundry is, you know, deeply involved in. Have you seen any use cases where folks are exploring Cloud Foundry to build their AI infrastructure, and if you have seen what kind of feedback, what kind of experience you have heard from them? There are people who advertise within the community of how Cloud Foundry is well suited for AI. So VMware and Tanzu, who are one of the big members, they have commercial offerings and they have customers who have signed up for this. And that's the only kind of report and feedback we're getting. I have not seen evidence of somebody coming and reporting open source Cloud Foundry itself. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't see why not, to be honest. Those folks who are building, you know, a lot of people are re-architecting their infrastructure for AI workloads. But they are all looking at the new shiny object, which is Kubernetes. But you're like, no, Cloud Foundry has solved these problems. And this is actually, look, the, the, as you rightly said, there is not a single technology that is going to solve everybody's problem. Though, you can use, use the same thing for everything. But where you see this is actually designed even it predates AI era, but designed in a way, because whether it's a developer experience, whether it's dealing with the infrastructure, that if you build, I mean, if some, if I ask you to build a hypothetical where you are using Cloud Foundry to build AI infrastructure for AI. I think that's a very interesting question. If you went to somebody with a paper and a pencil and said, you know, sketch out or architect your AI infrastructure, I think everybody will converge to a version of Cloud Foundry at some point because it's about, you know, having a scheduler at the core and then having all of these moving parts around the scheduler that can take all of these workloads, the long running one and the bursty ones, and then managing them very well for the infrastructure that lies underneath. And so that's Cloud Foundry in a nutshell, right? So you've always had a timeless scheduler it's, so if you take the case of Kubernetes, they were always meant for like long-standing workloads. Then you brought in projects like Volcano and a few others that do like better scheduling and better algorithms for how to do long-standing workloads, short workloads, etc. Which was already, you know, available in Cloud Foundry. So um, everybody will converge to a version of Cloud Foundry. And so I think you know, it's a, it's got a good answer, despite being a, a pretty old tech and pretty old set of tools for something that you really need to build your modern AI infrastructure. How do you see as Cloud Foundry has remained very resilient in respect of what technology is coming? How do you see Cloud Foundry technology and community evolve as AI becomes the core part of enterprise platform? So there's the production side of things, which is that AI is going to help people write and refine code. And then there is the pushing it to, or the consumption on infrastructure side of things, which is that AI is going to help deploy on very complex infrastructure, etc. People should be able to go from a prompt to production is my vision for the future. And so Cloud Foundry already does half the job. And there's only the question of generating the right kind of code in order for Cloud Foundry to be able to deploy it after that. So there's always going to be a space for Cloud Foundry in this generative AI era where 
a huge part of it in the enterprise is improving the developer experience and you know it's just going to aid that in a lot of ways and it's going to supplement the portions where okay a particular coding model helped me generate this code now what which is where everybody takes a break you give the right set of prompts you get some code and you start reviewing it and then you go back to your old ways of you know let me add this configuration let me do these kind of builds and let me add this to my version control etc there should be a much smoother way where you know you prompt and that becomes code and that gets deployed so there's there's a huge role in my opinion for cloud foundry to play over there ram thank you so much for joining me again and it was it's really refreshing to see not just i mean we do love to talk about cloud foundry's history but it is going to play depending on how the committee evolves as critical role in the future yeah. with the new workloads evolving because the kind of problems the way you have solved the problems uh, so thanks for sharing all those insights and i'll approach you again yeah thank thanks for no, thanks for having me it's always a pleasure be speaking to you about all of these new things but since you already have so much of context you always know the right questions to ask so thank you for this pleasure is all mine thank you